from ABC, this is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Good evening. 24 hours from now, the Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev will be here in New York. It's his second trip to the U.S. He will make a speech to the United Nations. He'll make a lot of news because his comings and goings will wreak havoc in a city which has terminal gridlock anyway. But the most important thing he will do is say goodbye to President Reagan and hello, let's talk business to George Bush. Our first report is from ABC's Walter Rogers, who has already arrived from Moscow. With New York dressing itself up for the holidays, Soviet officials are dropping big hints that Mr. Gorbachev is coming with some Christmas surprises for President Reagan and President-elect Bush. I would expect something very important in the area of arms reduction, I'm sure of that. The Soviets do not give details, but they do remind reporters of the 1986 Reykjavik summit, which began as a working get-together until Mr. Gorbachev surprised President Reagan with a comprehensive arms control package. Clearly, the Soviet leader is also coming now to size up the new American president-elect, and he's eager to learn Mr. Bush's attitude toward the Soviet Union, specifically toward a lowering of trade barriers. Today in New York, Soviet officials said there will be no specific list of topics for the Gorbachev meetings with President Reagan or President-elect Bush. The important thing they said is to keep the momentum going. The pauses in the U.S.-USSR dialogue will not exist. There will be no hiatus. It will be here in the United Nations General Assembly that Mr. Gorbachev actually unveils his new foreign policy initiatives on Wednesday. The Soviets are quick to say the meetings with Mr. Reagan and Mr. Bush are not a summit. But it is equally clear Mr. Gorbachev intends to use his visit to America to set the tone, if not the agenda, for superpower relations for the next four years. Walter Rogers, ABC News at the United Nations. There are those in this country who believe that Mr. Gorbachev may once again have something up his sleeve. We all know now that Mr. Gorbachev appears to enjoy surprises. Here's Sam Donaldson. So what is Gorbachev up to six months after Moscow? Why such deliberate pre-meeting hype? Surely something the experts agree. Gorbachev is filled with surprises. He really is always thinking a step ahead. He is a, um, a kind of a hustler. And he did a bit of that to Ronald Reagan and Reykjavik. If there is a hustle in the works, it is almost certainly directed not at his old sparring partner, Ronald Reagan, but at his new opponent, George Bush, and may just be a bit of international public relations. I'm sure the purpose of the hints is to raise expectations and then to make people seem to be reluctant and not responding to some generous new proposal by, by Gorbachev. I think this could backfire on the Soviets. Another reason Gorbachev may be trying to seize the moment when the three meet on Governor's Island in New York Harbor is to help strengthen his hand in fighting his battles back home. He does well internationally. He doesn't do well at home, and to the extent that he does well internationally, it makes him look good at home. And if Gorbachev makes new specific proposals on Wednesday, the once in future White House Press Secretary Marlon Fitzwater said today, the U.S. will say thank you and we'll take a look at them, but there'll be no on-the-spot negotiating. A point the president-elect underscored. There will be not be any commitment on my part in terms of specific uh, arms control proposals or things of that nature. Underneath all this, of course, is the understanding here that both sides have an interest in seeing that the Wednesday meeting helps move the Moscow-Washington relationship in a positive direction. And the Reagan-Bush team intends to do its part, but not at the risk of being hustled. Sam Donaldson, ABC News, the White House. What else is Mr. Gorbachev going to do here? Well, there were reports that one of the places he might visit would be the Trump Tower, Donald Trump shopping an apartment complex for the rich on Fifth Avenue. No doubt Mr. Trump would have loved the publicity. The reports prompted homeless advocates to say Mr. Gorbachev might do better to tour New York City's soup kitchens and shelters. As of now, the schedule is not firm. Mr. Gorbachev is expected to arrive around 3 o'clock Eastern time tomorrow afternoon. ABC News will carry his arrival live. One person who will not be at the United Nations meeting to hear him this week is the President of Nicaragua, Daniel Ortega. Ortega, who's been visiting Mexico, charged today that the United States did not issue enough visas for all the people who were supposed to accompany him. There is something of a minor diplomatic struggle going on here. The U.S. is angry over Nicaragua's refusal to issue visas for the number of American diplomatic personnel the U.S. wants in Nicaragua. In a moment, a grand jury indicts Jim Baker for fraud, conspiracy, and tax evasion while running the PTL. 
And later in the broadcast, on the American Agenda tonight, how do you encourage kids not to deal in oh, drugs? Crap. One man's what idea. Come into the company? And what might be called a timeless toy for Christmas, turning 30 and still topping the charts. This is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings, brought to you by Buick and your Buick dealer. To continue now, in case you have not heard much about the space shuttle Atlantis today, that is the way the military wants it. After all, it's supposed to be a secret mission, even though we've now been told the shuttle will land tomorrow afternoon in California, shortly after 6.30 Eastern Time. Thus, we are fairly certain that the shuttle did deploy a spy satellite over the weekend. Our next report was generated by a motorcycle accident in California over the weekend. It has to do with safety and with freedom of choice. The actor Gary Busey is in critical condition tonight. Aside from his personal injury, the broader point has to do with the fact that A, he was not wearing a helmet, and B, he was one of those people opposed to laws which make helmets mandatory. Here's ABC's Gary Shepard. When actor Gary Busey wasn't performing, he often went riding on his Harley Davidson. Yesterday, he left this bike shop in Culver City, California, and nearly killed himself. He skidded the motorcycle, and then he flipped, and when he flipped in the air, he landed on his back and his, and his head. Busey's bike suffered only minor damage, but the 44-year-old actor wound up with two blood clots near his brain and is in critical condition. He was not wearing a helmet. Busey was an outspoken opponent of mandatory helmet laws, and along with thousands of other California bikers, actively lobbied against them earlier this year. It's just the freedom of riding the bike without a helmet. You know, the air going through you, and just the freedom. It feels confining to wear a helmet. A study of motorcycle accidents by the University of Southern California indicates there's no question that helmets are worthwhile. Unhelmeted riders are about three times as likely uh, to suffer a serious head injury, they're about two and a half times as likely to die in a motorcycle accident. Just the same, only 21 states and the District of Columbia require all riders to wear a helmet. Five states have no helmet laws at all, and 24 mandate helmets only for young riders. In the 1970s, California led a successful fight to repeal federal regulations demanding helmet laws. But the issue is still hotly debated. Gene Thomason is a friend of Gary Busey. If if he could speak now, he still wouldn't want to see a helmet law. Last June, a law to make helmet use mandatory in California was vetoed by the governor. Today, that bill was reintroduced in the state legislature. Gary Shepard, ABC News, Los Angeles. Ever since Jim Baker stepped down from the PTL ministry more than a year and a half ago, there was always the possibility he might someday be indicted on criminal charges. Now he has been. A federal grand jury today handed down indictments against Baker and three church associates, charging them with fraud and conspiracy. ABC's Mike Von Frame is in Charlotte, North Carolina. The 22-member grand jury has been listening to testimony about the financial affairs of PTL for 16 months, focusing on Baker's TV sales pitch to viewers to become PTL lifetime partners. For a contribution, Baker promised partners a room at his religious theme park called Heritage USA near Charlotte, North Carolina. When you give your $1,000 gift, you'll receive a special membership card that will allow you to stay here in the Heritage Grand for four days and three nights every year for the rest of your life. Today's indictment charges Baker and three associates with selling partnership programs under false and fraudulent pretenses. According to the Justice Department, Baker solicited partnerships with the full knowledge that he could not accommodate the number of people who were buying them. $160 million was raised through the sale of lifetime partnerships, and Baker and his associates are accused of diverting PTL funds for their own benefit and the benefit of Jessica Hahn. The Justice Department says the one-time church secretary and now part-time disc jockey received $265,000 to keep her from publicly accusing Baker of misconduct. Today in Phoenix, Han said she is not unhappy at the prospect of Baker going to jail. He's a thief who has taken hundreds of millions of dollars of people's money. 
The Justice Department accuses both Jim and Tammy Baker of taking three and a half million dollar bonuses in ministry money while knowing PTL was in financial trouble. But of the Bakers, only Jim was indicted. If he's convicted on all 24 counts of wire and mail fraud, he faces maximum penalties of up to six million dollars and 120 years in jail. Mike Vaughn from ABC News, Charlotte, North Carolina. In other news today, the chairman of the Democratic Party, Paul Kirk, has announced that he is stepping down. He says it's for personal reasons. But bear in mind, the Democrats have just lost another presidential election, the fifth in six tries. The battle to name a successor to Kirk could be, to say the least, spirited. On Wall Street today, prices of blue chip stocks were up sharply. The Dow Jones Industrial Average rose about 31 and a half points, and the trading was actually fairly light. The Pentagon has taken another step towards implementing the president's Star Wars space defense program. It has awarded a $347 million contract to the Martin Marietta Denver Aerospace Corporation. It's going to finish design work on a space-based laser experiment, which is called Zenith Star. In our next segment, the refugees from war in Sudan and from famine. In Argentina, a four-day rebellion by a group of army officers appears to be over. Although there are still conflicting reports, the man who led the rebellion may not yet be in custody, and the deal which had been worked out to end the revolt may actually have fallen apart. Rebel officers have been demanding amnesty for other officers accused of human rights abuses during the period from 1976 to 1983, when the military ruled Argentina single-handed. For the first time in five years, Red Cross planes were flying food and supplies to people in the southern part of the Sudan today, a region devastated by five years of civil war. Thousands of people have already died, many of starvation. Others have escaped across the border to Ethiopia, where, as ABC's Don Cladster reports, they still cannot forget the horrors of war. Some nightmares never end. The fear of death. Hunger, disease, despair. For this child, it was the mere sight of our camera and our presence at his bedside that brought back memories and made him think soldiers were about to shoot him. He's not alone. Here in Finito, there are 43,000 refugees from Sudan, most of them children without parents, each with a terrifying story to tell. I don't know where my parents are, he says. I ran away when soldiers began shooting. I saw them shoot my father, brother, and uncle. They tried to kill me, too. For every person who manages to cross into Ethiopia, at least one dies along the way. These women say they ate tree leaves and insects to survive. Those with too many children had to abandon some. What can she do? And it's they, a matter of choice. And they die. Yes. No one knows how many have died since the war began. Camps here in Ethiopia already are swollen with nearly 350,000 refugees. <laughs> Though the horrors that have been visited on these people may seem like a biblical curse, they have not lost their Christian faith. God, they sing, will give us back the Sudan. God, if no one else, will bring us peace. Don Cladstrip, ABC News, in southwest Ethiopia. We have two other stories from overseas about children. A Palestinian teenager has become the latest casualty in the Israeli-occupied territories. Palestinian sources say the teenage girl was shot by Israeli soldiers try to break up a stone-throwing incident in the Gaza Strip. In the Central African nation of Cameroon, a rumor that a school building was about to collapse caused students at the school to panic. The building didn't collapse, but in the panic to get out, 50 students were killed, and dozens more were hurt. In a moment, our American agenda. How do we stop kids from dealing in drugs? Tonight, we begin our report on the American agenda with a rhetorical question. Can one person really make a difference? The issue tonight is drugs, specifically the fact that thousands of inner city kids are drawn into the drug business because, well, because it's a very easy way to make money. Tonight's report tends to emphasize...